Hi, welcome to Nav XP. We've got a really exciting guest lined up for today. And this is a webinar by executive pastors and executive directors for executive pastors and directors. And the whole point of Nav XP is to hopefully leverage the experience and the wisdom uh, and the skills of the executive pastor community to support the executive pastor community. There are a lot of uh, support networks and a lot of books and resources out there for uh, senior level leaders and there just aren't a whole lot of them here for second chair leaders and so what we wanted to do was gather around uh, the executive pastor and leader community and share together our experiences, our wisdom, hopefully in a way that is going to be able to engage uh, you and let your, you add your voice to the conversation. And so we are glad to have you here today. We've got Jenny Catron, who is a phenomenal executive director. And uh, I want to just go ahead and introduce Jenny. Jenny, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, Tony, for letting me be a part of this. And um, I love conversations with other exec pastors and executive directors. Just a lot of stuff we can learn from each other. So, um, so looking forward to this today. But I serve at Cross Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we're a multi-site church about 10 years old and with five locations. And um, my husband and I were actually part of the launch team that started Crosspoint 10 years ago. So I've been here from the beginning and um, just had the real privilege of being a part of the ministry God's doing here. I actually came on staff three years into the life of the church. Prior to that, I worked in the music business in Nashville. And so that's a whole other story. But um, just uh, really blessed to be a part of what God's doing here. It's um, growing and changing rapidly. And so it's keeping me on my toes every day. Uh, I know you just had a book that was released this month. Um, you co-authored that with uh, Sherry Surratt. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, Sherry Surratt and I have uh, been friends for several years, and uh, she's an another another dynamic woman in leadership. She actually serves as the president and CEO of Mops International right now. And uh, Sherry and I just over the years had a lot of conversations about um, are there what resources are there that exist to help equip women leaders particularly in the church we would get a lot of conversations about that and so she and I wrote a book called just lead the no whining no complaining no nonsense practical guide for women leaders in the church it might get the uh, the record for the longest book title ever um, but uh, it really was just a resource that we wanted to create to help equip um, uh, other women leader that are women leaders that are serving in the church and just need maybe a dose of encouragement or two. So uh, we just released that, and we're having a lot of fun talking about it as well. Uh, I read the book, and I think it's a valuable read for uh, for all leaders, men, women, um, and uh, it's been a great uh, it's been a great encouragement. There were a lot of things in the book that actually kind of revealed some things to me about my leadership as well, wow. and so so that was great, and and oftentimes a little bit painful. Oh, um, no. So congratulations on, on the book release. It's a phenomenal book, and I encourage everybody to, to, to go grab a copy. Um, I've got it on my Kindle, and, and I'm probably going to read through it again here in about three or four months just because there's so much content in it. Uh, it's hard to digest all at one time, and so uh, I'll probably give it another read through. Well, Jenny, tell us a little bit about what's the most exciting thing that's going on in your leadership life at the moment. Uh, Crosspoint, we just relocated our broadcast campus, which or our main campus, if you will, and uh, that was a monster undertaking. And those of you who have been through building projects um, understand the joys and pains um, of that. And we said this was like birthing a child, except it took me two years to birth this baby. And uh, it's been quite a project to um, see our whole campus relaunch, relocate. We actually just moved in this past Sunday. And now we're scrambling to figure out how to be adjusted for Easter in a brand new building. But, um, you know, I think with that, there were just so many um, things that I was learning right in the thick of it of just leading our staff through um, a major transition, helping lead the congregation through a major transition, as well as just figure out how to physically relocate into a new building and how to function in a new space. So it's been a really um, crazy time um, for us as a for us as a church, but also really exciting and energizing. So um, that's probably the biggest thing going on right now in my world is just helping our, lead our team through that and lead our team well through that. Well, that's a tremendous undertaking, I know, both uh, organizationally as well as emotionally. Sure. Well, today we're going to be talking about alignment. And mm -hmm. uh, given that we're executive directors, executive pastors, a large part of the task of the practical application of a church's vision uh, direction, strategy, mission, all those things 
uh, falls on our shoulders. And so alignment, the idea of getting everybody on one page, pulling together in the same direction around a common vision, uh, usually falls greatly to uh, executive level leaders. And so, uh, Jenny, I want to leverage a little bit of your experience, uh, a little bit of your wisdom, uh, and how you have undertaken the, the monumental task of getting everybody on the same page, um, as well as talking about some things uh, that are symptoms of when you don't have great alignment. There are a couple things that, that you'll see, and if your church is experiencing any of these, these are often symptoms of having a misalignment uh, with your staff and with your ministry teams, uh, and it can result in things like excessive fatigue, uh, mm -hmm. wasted resources, unnecessary tension, uh, and some unhealthy ministry rhythms. And um, those are just kind of some symptoms, but obviously the opposite can be true as well. Uh, that, that when we do have good alignment, that we have uh, more energy uh, mm -hmm. to push forward into ministry, uh, that we're making the best use of resources, mm -hmm. uh, that we have healthy tension when it's necessary, but a lot of those unhealthy tensions, the competition for resources and, and for other things, uh, get eliminated, and um, we have a steadier, healthier rhythm of ministry. Um, and so I know that you bring a tremendous amount of experience and capacity to this, particularly as you lead uh, a campus of... Uh, or a church of five campuses. And so, Jenny, I just want to just ask a couple questions that will help catapult us into your experience uh, as an executive director yeah. uh, and what that has to do with alignment. Um, can you tell us where you see the effects of alignment or sometimes misalignment uh, mm -hmm. show up most, most strongly or most notably? Yeah, I, I love the four things that you just talked about, Tony, because I think, you know, as you were listing through those four, uh, four, four issues, I just, you know, can look at different points in our history where you see those different things. And I really like the point that you made about um, excessive fatigue or if you are aligned that you have more energy. And I think that's one of the things that I've seen um, even in like this project of this relocation for us as a campus that, um, you know, where we, where, you know, you never have enough staff to do ministry like we always run on lean staff and so you always feel like you're just a little behind the ball that's just part of um, I think the ministry culture but uh, when when teams are in good alignment and you create a culture where the communication is really strong and you're helping move them well in the in in a, in a direction and they have good um, they have good instruction they know what the vision is they know where they're going you see like this spring in their step so even like this relocation for us which was a daunting task I saw more energy and more engagement from my staff when they had actually like a bigger project in front of them than they would in a normal season. And so I think that speaks to alignment of how critical it is that when you are so hyper focused on the importance of aligning your team, how you, you see those four things come into play. And, you know, for us, when we did this relocation, we put a task force together, you know, and like immediately defined a team of like, uh, a dozen people who had very specific responsibilities and it kind of you know you just start breaking down the silos and the the individualism or individual team mentalities that can happen in ministry and when you have one shared like unified goal you kind of just you know everything else kind of goes away and you've got this unified vision and um, and I think that becomes super critical in um, alignment is just that shared vision and always looking for what that is um, uh, uh, Patrick Lencioni has that book, Silos, Politics, and Turf Wars, and um, the, I just love his idea of you have to create your crisis. You know, whether you have a crisis or not, you have to figure out what's your crisis that unifies your whole team to kind of keep them focused on the same thing. So that's where that vision thing is just so, so incredibly critical and mm -hmm. hard to figure out how to keep a vision in front of them at all times. It's hard to convince some leaders the idea that focus expands. It expands your influence. It expands your impact. Uh, it really focuses your ability to move forward. And that's, I mean, that's what alignment is all about, is you're absolutely right. It's putting something in front of people that gives them a larger vision so that we can all work together and push towards it. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine what relocating a main campus uh, for a church your size would be like. So congratulations again on getting it done before yeah. Easter. <clears throat> and now you've only got Easter coming up, right? So, you know, yeah. no sweat. <laughs> yeah, not a big deal. We'll be fine. <laughs> well, Jenny, you segued right into uh, what my next question was, was um, talk a little bit about how being on mission uh, impacts align alignment and unity in your experience. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of alluded to that, the idea of, of being on mission or vision. Um, maybe you can even give us a, a story or an example of how you have seen staff come together around the idea of mission, being yeah. on mission. 
Yeah, I think that's um, critical. And I've seen that a couple of times. You know, it's easy for, especially in a multi-site church, and I think it happens in any church, but multi-site immediately magnifies the individualism, like campuses start kind of doing their own thing. And um, and not all of that is bad, but helping them see um, the, the necessity for unity. Um, a few years ago, we realized, we saw kind of a drift in our team of, uh, this 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 idea that they always had to hire staff for every need that arose in the church, and you know we were in a in a great season where we had a little more resources than we might have in the previous year, and um, instead of training up volunteers, we were you know always pitching for new hires. You know, mm. and I saw this drift in our team, and I was like, I don't like. I don't like where this is going because we're a volunteer organization. You know, our main goal as staff in our culture is to raise up volunteers to do ministry. And I was seeing this drift in that unless it was something that you could give a five-minute overview and explain to somebody and let them run, they felt like it had to be a hired position. And so I realized really quickly that there was this issue of volunteer development that was it was drifting. That of it, you know, that's one of our core parts of our. Um, of our staff values is volunteer development and making sure we're empowering volunteers. And I just realized that core value was drifting and unless I kind of rallied the team back around that, that was going to continue to become a problem. Volunteer development was going to be an issue. And so I made that just an all staff, all campus initiative for a year and said, give it, we call it giving ministry back, like putting ministry back into the hands of volunteers, letting them do the work of the ministry, equipping them for that, letting their gifts flourish and allowing them to use their gifts inside of the church for, uh, for ministry purposes. And uh, we made that kind of the crisis for the whole staff of that, guys, you will not get your jobs done unless you equip volunteers to do it. And so it was one of those situations where um, I saw a drift, I saw a vision drift of, you know, that part of our critical mission is, is helping volunteers accomplish ministry. And uh, I was seeing it drift, and so we circled up, we made it a part of everybody's performance plan for that year. Um, every week during our all staff meetings, I would highlight a story of somebody who gave ministry back, like empowered a volunteer well. And so I just made it a part of the culture for a year, and we saw that turn around. And so I think that's just one little nugget, one story of a situation where I saw vision kind of drifting in an area and when I made it essential for the whole staff to kind of raise that value and I integrated it into our culture into our daily routines we saw it kind of start to, to turn around a bit. That's absolutely great. I, I get so excited when I hear about churches that truly have core values that they can live out and lead from um, and exactly what you're talking about is what we call uh, vision dripping. You know, right. you have the idea of vision casting, which is a kind of a one-to-many, um, usually from a pulpit or, or from a, a, a lecture-type type environment. Um, and that's vision casting. Uh, right. But what you're talking about is vision dripping. And drip irrigation is so much more effective than spray irrigation. That's In the good. same way, vision is so much more effective when you can drip it into the daily life of mm -hmm. actual ministry yeah. uh, instead of just casting it from, from the big platform one-to-many. And sure. so that's, I mean, I just get so excited when I hear about churches that are able to lead from their core values. Jenny, I wanted to ask you, you know, chapter 9, I, as I was reading Just Lead, chapter 9, I want to pull out a quote here that, that I think um, is phenomenal. I loved reading it, and, I, and I've read it several times since then. I actually have it written up on my whiteboard. Um, <clears throat> and I want to read it, and it talks about that idea of momentum and unity and the idea of communication. And so I thought it was worth pulling out here. It says, communication is the channel in which vision is delivered. At its best, it can serve as a rallying cry, informing team members which hill needs to be conquered and the role they need to play and why their efforts will make a difference. A stellar vision and strategy are only as good as they are understood. I love that line. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I've seen far too many teams lose momentum or get derailed entirely because of misunderstandings resulting in poorly cast vision. Jenny, can you give us a few tips um, from your experience of how alignment can increase momentum for a church? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think the communication component of this is so um, so huge. There's a probably an old leadership cliche that says everything rises and falls on leadership. 
And I would add to that and say if everything rises and falls on leadership, leadership rises and falls on communication. Because um, communi communication is kind of that core, that, um, that center point to good alignment. You know, in that particularly when you're dealing with people, um, just your systems for communication and how you're helping um, make sure if people don't have good information they're not going to be well aligned you know they're not going to be able to really come alongside and and align and be unified with the rest of the team and that gets more complicated as the organization gets bigger you know the more people that you've got in the mix the more spread out they might be if they're at multiple campuses um, that communication po component becomes so essential to alignment because if they're going off all different directions you just lose um, you lose all ability to help keep people unified and moving in the same direction. And so I think communication is the crux of that. Um, what that looks like varies from organization to organization. And I would say we kind of, uh, we revisit our communication systems and that includes meetings and, you know, all different kinds of ways that we gather as a team. Uh, we'll revisit that every six months and blow it up completely and like redo things. If it's not working, if it's not helping us accomplish what we need to accomplish, if we're not going in the same direction, uh, then we revisit everything to go, okay, do we have the right people in the room? Do we have the right, you know, meetings? We call them, um, uh, uh, what are, I forget the phrase I always use, instead of meetings, because people hate meetings. Um, but uh, structured communication, you know, it's those opportunities, those moments for you to make sure everybody's around the table to have the conversations and to, and to get um, the right information out. So um, I think communication to me is kind of essential to that alignment. But then I think as a leader, uh, you've got to really be looking ahead and identifying what are those what are, you know, seeing before you derail, you've got to be able to see where you're starting to come off the tracks, you know, and so like that example I gave you of the volunteer development issue, we didn't have a crisis of volunteers yet, but if we hadn't addressed it early on, we would have, we would have experienced a crisis and it could have become something that started to have our ministry go backwards instead of forwards. And so I think when you sit in, um, like an exec pastor seat or a similar level of leadership, you have to be willing to kind of always be looking out ahead and going, okay, where are we starting to drift or drip? You know, where are we starting to see um, some things not going exactly the direction we want? And then we've got to help pull that back together um, and find those points of alignment. So I think it's, you know, the communication, the daily interaction with the team and making sure you've got the right systems to facilitate that. But then secondly, I think it's the discipline as a leader to make sure you're pulling out from the day-to-day -day and the busyness to make sure you've really got an eye on what's going on and, and, and are you um, headed in the right direction. Um, I, I think exec pastors sit in the seat where it's our job to put feet to vision. I think most of us are you know, in a second chair role for the purpose of taking the vision of the lead pastor, your elders, um, whoever sets that vision, and your job is the um, uh, putting feet to that and keeping that on the tracks, keeping that vision going the way it's supposed to go. And so I think there's a discipline in our role of leadership to make sure we're really doing the homework to sit down and process and look out ahead of stuff. That's, that's great. That's great. You know, something you said reminded me, um, you know, being able to look out ahead, even mm -hmm. when you're not in a crisis yet, and to identify where you're about to come off the tracks, um, it reminds me of a great quote by Albert Einstein. It says, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. And so that's, that's fantastic. That's, that's just what you're saying is that you have to be able to, to look ahead. Uh, and I love that. And I, a lot of leadership development is really focused around how do we eliminate silos? How do we bust through these, um, these walls of, of protective uh, emotion? And how do, we, how do we make this thing work and get everybody back on the same page with the same, the same vision, passionate about our mission? Um, can you and, and you've identified some of them already, um, just in the ways that you guys get together and communicate, and make sure that that everybody has a voice in, in the conversation. Um, can you tell me a little bit about kind of what is it you use to kind of break those silos up? I can only imagine that with a multi-campus um, ministry, they become even more pronounced over time. Sure. Um, so, so where do you where do you find the healthy balance of helping people say, okay, this is my area of responsibility, right. and I am focused on that. But I'm yeah. making sure that it that everything I do is is in is in service of the larger mission. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's so good, and I think it's really difficult, um, particularly in multi-site ministry, because you've actually physically created silos by having multiple campuses, and so I think you know we, you uh, you immediately have to start figuring out where do we break down those walls and create some of that unity. Um, and I think there's a few things. I don't think there's a magic formula. I think there's a lot of intuition that has to go into and discernment into how do you how do you spot those things as a leader and then lean into them and I think that would probably be my first um, thing that I probably preach even to myself is that when you see a point of caution you've got to step into it that's why you're the leader that's why you sit in that seat is to help um, lead people out of those those funky places when they start getting a little territorial or they get a little protective of their area or they start missing the bigger picture uh, that you've got to step into those conversations and a lot of times that can quickly be solved with some quick one-on-one -on -one, because typically and I, and I find this happen a lot I will be sensitive to that one person in the room who is um, who isn't really on board with the whole the whole vision or you know maybe they're at a campus and they're feeling a little um, frustrated because their campus isn't seeing the same results as the other campus or their ministry team isn't seeing the same momentum as another ministry team and you become sensitive to that as a leader like you start being sensitive to that um, sensitive to their sensitivity but what I can do is I can sometimes um, instead of celebrating where another team is doing well I, do, I end up not sharing that because I don't want to hurt this person's feelings but in doing so I'm not celebrating what is actually working and I'm just playing to that person who might actually need a one-on-one -on -one conversation and a little bit of either uh, they need a little bit of vision cast to them. They need to be encouraged of why we're all in this together. So I would I would say that um, always celebrating what is working and where it's working and looking to um, to uh, bring attention to each different ministry and so that they they all sense that you're championing them you're on you're celebrating them you're on board with them um, and when you see those points and you see and usually it's an individual it's rarely a whole team when it's when it's become a whole team that's siloed it's gone on too long in my opinion and so I think when you start to see some some unhealthy attitudes or some mentalities that are territorial I think you've got to step into that right away so that it doesn't end up um, infiltrating that whole team that goes back to that unity thing of you know you just gotta be willing to and, and it might not mean you it might mean you have to go to their leader and say hey I'm seeing something here I really want you to address this with your team and help figure out what's going on why what's why are they disgruntled where are they feeling left out sometimes it's a asking good questions um, I have a tendency to just be I see the big picture so I'm like why isn't everybody on board what's going on and I have a couple of key staff that are, are just really discerning and they're in the trenches so they kind of hear you know what's going on among the staff and so I will go to those folks and go hey what where are the concerns where are the frustrations um, and making sure I've got a good ear to what's legitimate and then what's just some bad attitude you know that needs to be you know needs to be addressed yeah that's 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 phenomenal I I hear uh, one, one of our core values at Oxano is carnivorous learning and I, I love that concept of just being always in the posture of listening and learning and yeah. saying, hey, there, there's, there may be something legitimate here, and I need to pay attention to it. Uh, yeah. And that, that's great. Well, I want to remind everybody that, again, part of, part of the, the webinar format is that we want your voice to be a part of the conversation. And so mm -hmm. just remind everybody that if you have something you'd like us to address, or either in this webinar or in a future webinar, or, or on the website as a continued conversation, just tweet uh, with the NAVXP hashtag, um, and, and we, will, we will see if we can get to it. Um, and we've actually had one person who's already asked a question of us, uh, and I want to see if we can get that in here. Um, J.C. Raymond asks, can you give an example of how to deal with passive resistance and getting everyone going one direction? A lot of times, um, I, I think, um, the pa I, I'm assuming when they're talking about passive resistance, it's just kind of that person that's a little disengaged, just not fully engaging, and... Um, there's usually something else going on in that person's life. Nine times out of ten, um, it's rarely that they're just resistant to what's going on here, but there's something else going on in their in their story, in their life, etc. And so um, that's one of the ways where if I find somebody who just seems pretty disengaged or just not really embracing and joining in on the vision, you first have to ask yourself, is it the right person? Like, are they? You know, if they're not fully in and on board with the vision, you don't really have like I, it, not to be 
um, calloused or insensitive, but we can't. We we don't have a lot of ministry dollars to have people on the team who just aren't fully engaged with the vision and fully on board. And so that's always a question mark of well, were they once on board? Were they once fully engaged? Um, and if they were, then what's happened? That's kind of you know. And is it something in their personal life, or is there something at work that they're unhappy with? But if that person has always operated that that way, I would question. Okay, do we have the right person or in the right seat? Um, what's the reason why they just haven't fully embraced this vision? Is the job not what they expected? Is the ministry not what they expected? And again, opening up those conversations with them. But mm -hmm. oftentimes when I see a staff person who is all of a sudden kind of disengaged or resistant to something that they would ordinarily be pretty excited about, um, there's usually something else going on. And so um, if, if you know, and if it, if I'm not the person who has the relationship with them to kind of ask the 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 more personal questions, then I'll usually lean into one of my other exec team members or their direct boss and say, hey, you know, let's let's talk with that individual and see what's going on in their world and in their life. And as a leader, I think um, spiritual leadership is, as especially as ministry leaders, um, but as, as just as believers, I think there's a spiritual leadership component to our jobs that it would be obvious, but I think, again, in those situations, it's really praying for discernment and praying for the opportunity to dig a little deeper to find out what is going on in their world and again nine times out of ten I usually discover that there's something else that they're dealing with that maybe they just haven't felt they could share or wanted to share or might not have even been necessary to share but it kinda helps give you a bigger picture that there's another reason why they're not fully engaged with you at that season and sometimes they just need some space and they need some permission to be um, a little on the outside, but if that, but it can't stay that way, obviously. So yeah, yeah. Well, gosh, being an executive director, executive pastor is always a very difficult tension of sensitivity to people's lives, as well as making hard decisions about what's best for the ministry. Yeah, and and I've discovered that as because of that role, you can't always be that person because you're often the bad guy. Um, and so learning to lean into your staff who do have more of the shepherding and the pastoral side of leadership, which again, I think there's a there's that's part of what needs to drive us, but we aren't always the one who can implement that because of the the responsibility we carry. And so, learning to lean into your staff who can serve people in that way that you maybe can't. You know, um, we've had situations where um, some of you know some of the people that work directly with me, there's somebody else on our team who can shepherd them during a personal issue better than I can. You know, that might not be the, the space that I can best serve them, but I can help connect them to somebody who can. Um, and so I think just being sensitive to that and understanding that where we can provide care or support when they're going through something else that's really even outside of work, but give them that support structure, it goes a long way. Absolutely. And that's, a, that's, that's one of the lessons that's hardest to learn. I know it was for me um, as an executive pastor is you don't have to do everything yourself even though a lot of it still falls on your plate as a responsibility, it's all about enabling and utilizing the people that God has put around you uh, to accomplish the ministry that he has for you. Well, Jenny, I want to ask you, if you could communicate one thing about alignment to every executive pastor, executive director in the country, what would it be? Hmm, that's a big one. Um, I think it would be, uh, I think I would go back to that that point of just being um, making sure you're taking the time and the discipline to be learning yourself. Um, you know that you've built in opportunities for you to be to learn, to grow, to be challenged, so that you're looking out ahead. Um, I think one of the most dangerous things we do as leaders, and most of the time we've gotten to this place of leadership because we get stuff done. You know, we are the people who jump in and we can get stuff done, and we. Um, we're drivers and initiators and all of those things, but we get to a leadership seat where the people around us need us for our wisdom, um, for our experience, and for our availability to help them problem solve, and we can dangerously get keep ourselves too busy. And again, it's ministry. There's always more to be done than can actually get done. And so I think that I would really just challenge your staff can't be unified and aligned and moving in the right direction if you're scattered. You know, and so I think your own health as a leader is just so essential to making sure you can lead everybody else well. Um, and so I think just making sure you're pulling out and you're identifying what are those core things, what are those core issues that we need to be focused on, and then am I looking out enough to actually be 
of looking at the landscape and making sure we're still on the right we're still on the right path. Mm, great, great. Thank you so much for your insight. Church Unique. Um, some of you have probably read that, but it's a phenomenal resource. We go a little bit backwards to what we're talking about—the idea of this overwhelming, compelling vision uh, that everybody can gather around and drive them forward is a great resource uh, to help out with understanding what alignment can mean for your ministry, uh, and the fact that nothing can substitute for that for that compelling vision. Uh, and how that gets all the people pulling in the same direction. Jenny, what other resources would you recommend for pastors who may be struggling with getting everybody on the same page or pulling in the same direction? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I mentioned uh, the silos, politics, and turf wars. That was a mm -hmm. huge one for me several years ago. Um, another resource that we just went through, I guess, last year or so was Great by Choice by Jim Collins, and uh, he talks about the 20-mile march principle. And I think, you know, as leaders, especially in ministry, there's always, and, and we're in a culture where everything is moving and changing so rapidly. And the thing I loved about the 20 mile march principle is it said, what are the things that are core to how you do ministry, the way God has called you to create your, um, your vision and live that out and define what are those things that whether we're in a good season or we're in a bad season, we're going to be safe, safe, faithful to those measurables, you know? And so for us, it's things like, um, 80%, our goal is 80% of our folks are in a small group because we feel like that that structure for discipleships works really well for us. Um, it's things like we're always going to save at least 10% and we're going to give at least 10% to missions. doesn't matter if we're in a crisis financially, we're going to be faithful to those core those core principles. And so the, that that discussion from that book forced us to go, okay, what are these core things that we feel like keep us aligned on our vision as a church? So that's very big picture. There's a lot of things that can change and move, you know, throughout the organization. Um, but those core things we feel like are essential to our health as a church. Um, so that was a big one for me was, was great by choice. But again, so many great resources, but those were a couple that have really served us well. Absolutely. That is a phenomenal book. Well, Jenny, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your experience with us. Uh, I, I appreciate your heart for helping develop other leaders. Um, the book is great for that. Everybody go out and buy the book, Just Lead. Uh, it is, it's phenomenal whether you're a man, woman, leader in the church. Uh, it's filled with some good insight and some things that are really going to help you move forward as a leader. Um, remember, the greatest value in this webinar format is in you joining the conversation and making your voice heard as well. And so we want to invite you to continue to be a part of the conversation. Um, this will be posted afterwards on TonyBowick.com as well as uh, Jenny's uh, website, JennyCatron.tv. Uh, and you can find the video there. You can continue to comment, ask questions. We want to welcome your, your input um, and make this something that is going to continue to bless uh, the church leader community uh, from this point onwards. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we love being here with you today, and we pray that you have a fantastic Easter and that God helps you to bring um, a harvest in for his kingdom during this time of celebration and remembrance of his son. Thanks so much for joining us with NAVXP. We'll see you again soon.